Lakeland Public Television, the Bemidji Pioneer, the Brainerd Dispatch, and KAXE Northern Community Radio are proud to present Debate Night 2014, a look at our area legislative candidates. And now the State House of Representative District 5A debate. Your moderator tonight is Warren Larson. Good evening and welcome to Debate 2014, six state legislative debates over four nights. We're in Lakeland, Lakeland Public Television Studio in Bemidji. Our candidates for tonight's debate are John Purcell, the Democrat, and Philip Nelson, the Republican. Our panel for tonight's debate are Dennis Wyman, Lakeland Public Television News Director, Zach Kaiser, Bemidji Pioneer Reporter, Scott Hall, Public Affairs Director for Northern Community Radio, KAXE and KBXE. The rules for tonight's debate. Uh, each candidate will be given three minutes for opening comments. Uh, our panel will ask questions after opening comments. Some will co be their own questions, others will be from the public. The candidates will rotate the order they speak beginning with opening comments and fi finishing with closing comments. Each candidate gets two minutes to answer the questions. Each candidate will have a one-minute rebuttal opportunity. Questions continue until we are about 50 minutes into the debate when we move to closing comments. The closing comments will be two minutes each. So let's start the debate. Um, we will start with our opening comments, and um, Mr. John Purcell uh, will start with the opening comments. Thank you, Warren. And, uh Thanks to our panel for taking time out of your schedules and to my uh, opponent here tonight, uh, Philip Nelson, uh, for this opportunity to share um, our ideas uh, about how we can move Minnesota forward, continue the momentum that we have gained over the last couple of years. And uh, I just, uh, uh, I just, finished my third term in the Minnesota House of Representatives, so I, I think I, uh, a lot of folks know who I am, but I'm, I'm going to say a, just a couple of things from a personal level. I've I, uh, uh, been in Bemidji for uh, many decades now since I got out of the military, uh, and uh, I I'm happily married uh, wife, Teresa, and we have eight kids and 10 grandchildren, the newest of whom, uh, grandson, Kyan, just turned a month old. So we have had some celebrations around our house uh, in the last weeks. Um, I uh, live east of Bemidji, about six miles out of town, uh, and uh, have worked on the Leech Lake Indian Reservation uh, in tribal government, different capacities for uh, nearly 40 years now. I just want to um, say a few things about uh, why I ran a number of years ago for the position of state representative, and it was it was all driven by uh, what I saw going on in state government and to some extent federal government, but how our state was being affected and uh, not the least of which was uh, when uh, my children were uh, out of high school here in Bemidji, they uh, were had good grades and they got some couple of academic scholarships here at Bemidji State University and uh, their tuition was reasonably subsidized, I would offer, by the state of Minnesota. The state covered about 70% of the tuition at that time. This was 20-some years ago now. And that got reversed, and uh, that was one of the big drivers for me was uh, we need to get uh, educational opportunities for our children and grandchildren again here in the state, and we've been able to accomplish that, moving, moving that meter toward, uh, back toward the students in Minnesota. So. Um, I'll leave it at that for now. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Purcell. Um, Mr. Nelson, your opening comments. Well, to say, first off, I have no idea what I'm doing here tonight, so I'm just going to wing this. 
the way I usually do. Um, I'm running on a, a three-point platform. Uh, the first point is campaign finance reform. Uh, and that is, uh, I'm not accepting any uh, financial contributions to my campaign this year. Uh, everybody complains about how uh, money flows in and out and through politics, and I figured let's just keep that out of the equation this time around and try something different. So here's something different for everybody who complains about that. Second point is jobs creation. If you do want to donate to the uh, Republican campaign for this district, again, take your money, take your money, walk downtown, and buy something that's made in America because that's more important than some guy getting elected into office. As those people out there, our, our neighbors, they need jobs. And the only way that our neighbors are going to start getting jobs is if we start spending money in politics again. Excuse me. Into the economy again. Uh, the third point is tax burden reduction. As some, uh, many people know that there's a uh, tax rebate you can get from the government when you donate to a campaign uh, because I'm not accepting any um, contributions to my campaign that's not even in the question so the thousands of dollars are being saved by the taxpayers right there uh, a lot of people get up and they say this is what I'm gonna do when I'm in office this is what I want to do I don't know what I can do when I'm in office and I think any candidate who gets up and says that definitively one way or another either doesn't know what they're talking about or is lying to you so these are the things that I am doing I don't know what I'm going to do. This is what I am doing. Bemidji is my home. Through the last uh, several weeks, I've had the opportunities of meeting several people uh, from various parts of District 5, and they're wonderful people. I look forward to serving my community in the best way that I possibly can. Okay, thank you, Mr. Nelson. Let's uh, open it up for questions. Our first question would come from uh, Dennis Wyman. Okay, thank you, Warren, and thank you both candidates for joining us tonight. Uh, first question is involving aquatic invasive species. Our lakes and rivers are obviously vitally important to not only the economy of northern Minnesota, but also our way of life. It seems like the fight against aquatic invasive species is just beginning. Recently, zebra mussels were confirmed in Cass Lake. I know the state legislature has attempted to address this, and I'd like to hear your assessment on how we're faring in this clearly difficult battle, and if you think we're doing enough to stop the spread of aquatic invasive species. All right. Thank you, Dennis. That, that first question comes to you, Mr. Nelson. Uh, <clears throat> I'm personally of the opinion that maybe it's time we really give a strong look at isolating the lakes and not allowing foreign boats going into them. Uh, Cass Lake getting zebra mussels, that's the entire Mississippi watershed. That's three quarters of the nation just got zebra mussels, people. This is not good. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's time to do something strong and hard and get it done because this is not okay. I don't want this stuff in Bemidji. I don't want this stuff in the lake that my cabin's on. I don't want this stuff in the lake my parents live on. I don't want it around. So let's do something about it. Okay. All right. Um, Mr. Purcell. Thank you, Warren. Uh, you know, we do have to figure out how to pick our fights uh, on the AI aquatic invasive species issue. And... Uh, we started down this track a couple of years ago at the legislative level, uh, trying to get some funding toward uh, aquatic invasive species and uh, help to identify what fights do we have a chance of winning. And we put money to the University of Minnesota to try and put the best brains that we can have uh, on this and uh, the Aquatic a Invasive Species uh, Center at the University of Minnesota is actively engaged um, it, it it does appear to me that the uh, this uh, carp issue uh, is one that we can uh, prevail on and we are going to have the St. Anthony lock uh, uh, close there at St. Anthony Falls Minneapolis that's going to really help uh, I think we're going to need a some electric barriers above St. Anthony uh, just as some for some redundancy uh, up in those watersheds to keep those carp out because uh, you never know when something's going to get transported, uh, uh, you know, via a minnow bucket. That, that's, that's an ongoing issue. Uh, 
So um, it definitely, uh, the uh, uh, zebra mussels are, are another issue and they, of course they aren't the only one, but they're the one closest to home right now. Um, and uh, we're gonna need the university's help to determine whether or not we can win that one. And if we can, what's gonna take it out? What's gonna do away with the zebra mussel? All right, um, Mr. Nelson, did you have a rebuttal? I just think it's a great show of leadership to see that the, the state's already looking at it and has uh, uh, the university doing their thing. So keep going, guys. We need it. Okay. Mr. Purcell, did you have a rebuttal? No, I'm fine. Thank you. All right. Uh, next question would come from Zach Kaiser. Hi, guys. Thank you for coming out today. Uh, my first one is kind of a general question. Uh, name the three biggest issues facing the district and what would you do to help solve these issues? Okay, thanks, Zach. Uh, that question goes to you, Mr. Purcell. Thank you. I, um, well, I mentioned one in my introduction, and that's education. And uh, we're doing some work, and you know, as I as I said, trying to crawl out of a little bit of a hole that we dug from the uh, late '90s up through uh, 2010, 12, uh, and we balance the budget in a straightforward way, so we're climbing out of that hole, I do believe now, with education, with all the everyday kindergarten and on up through the, uh, through the college level. To, uh, so uh, that's, that's a big one. Uh, I've been very involved in becoming um, more and more aware, I've always been aware, but more and more aware of homelessness and housing issues. And uh, we've also tried to do something about that. We got to start. We put $100 million of bonding money into uh, housing issues. Uh, and that should get us 5,000 units, uh, new or uh, refurbished units in the state of Minnesota. Um, uh, those are the projections anyway. So, so that's a, um, a significant issue. The, the third one that I, I think we have to keep going on uh, tax reform. Um, I, it just was too complex uh, and it doesn't have to be that way and let's simplify our tax system. I want to keep working on that. All right. Thanks, Mr. Purcell. Uh, Mr. Nelson. Uh, three biggest issues to our district that I see uh, is uh, it's not only uh, jobs, uh, jobs that are available uh, looking at uh, the pipeline and also the copper and silver mining. Um, Wow, I forgot what that was. All right, that's gone. Um, three biggest things, uh, pipeline jobs, mining jobs. Uh, the third one is human services. There's a pretty solid problem in, in the uh, Department of Human Services at the county levels. Uh, it's, it's rampant in, Be in Beltrami, and I would assume that because of that, it, it's also showing itself other places. Uh, so here's my question to the voters of, the, of 75,000 people that are apparently watching this right now. How many times can you make an unfulfilled promise to a single mother, to an educated single mother, before she makes a decision to go off and sell drugs in her body so that she can feed and clothe her children? That's happening right now in this community, and that's not okay. You know, it's, there's a big book, there's guidelines, those guidelines are not being met. And I don't know what I can do about it, but I'm telling somebody about it because it needs to change. All right. Well, thank you. Um, Mr. Purcell, any rebuttal? No. Mr. Nelson? No. Okay. Our next question would come from Scott Hall. All right. Thanks, Warren. Right now, Minnesota depends on coal, gas, and uranium from, and oil from other states and nations for most of our energy. What's your vision for Minnesota's long-term energy needs? Okay, thanks, thanks, Scott. Um, that first question would go to Mr. Nelson. Well, there's lots of people out there still trying to nail down that cold fusion thing, and uh, as long as hobbyists want to keep dinking around on that, go right ahead. I think that's a great idea. Uh, otherwise, uh, thorium nuclear reactors, the technology has been around for 60 years, and we haven't even touched it. It's basically a, well, it's a nuclear reactor that can't go explosion like Fukushima. Uh, it's a safe power supply. It uses a relatively small amount of fuel, and they're tiny and inexpensive, and they can't melt down. It's kind of nice. So there's some energy for you that we can tap into that we haven't because we can't make bombs out of it. All right. 
Um, Mr. Purcell. Thanks, Warren. I, I, uh, on the, uh, the uh, nuclear, you know, um, I think when we figure out how to harness fusion, we're, we're going to use nuclear, and that's uh, a little ways off yet, but uh, um, I, we're going to continue our push for renewable uh, energy in the state, uh, and at the same time, we're going to continue to use uh, petroleum products and coal um, for some time to come. And, and some of this stuff goes beyond Minnesota in the sense that um, from my military experience, which was a while ago, mind you, and now they have drones and stuff they didn't have when I was in, but uh, we aren't going to run our ships and planes and tanks off of anything but petroleum for some time to come. And, uh, you know, so there's some national defense stuff associated with that. Uh, I, I, I also, we're going to need base load energy, and, and when we get figured how to, <clears throat> excuse me, how to get that base load energy from other than coal in our part of the world here, um, we'll, we'll be able to move on. Um, and wind is coming along with that. Uh, we're, we're getting more and more wind energy, it seems like, every year, and I'm hearing good things from our utilities that are providing uh, the energy for us every day. Um, but it's going to be a mix, and I think we're just going to have to uh, buckle down and realize that it's going to be a mix for some time to come. All right. Thank you, Mr. Purcell. Uh, Mr. Nelson, yes. any rebuttal? Uh, everybody understands uh, the weight of the, the, the term German engineering. Okay, so German engineering says that solar power mm -hmm. is really good for Germany. And if German engineering says that solar power is really good for Germany, then I say solar power is really good for the United States too. And in Minnesota, we have a higher, like, we have more solar energy than Germany does. And if Germany is spending as much money on this stuff as they, as they are and see it as being the future, then maybe we should jump on this ship a little bit more because it's kind of silly that we're not. All right. Mr. Purcell? Just, just to uh, um, reinforce, solar is coming along, and, and we will continue to utilize more solar. The price is coming down. All right. Thank you. Uh, the next question would be from Dennis Wyman. Thanks, Warren. A uh, proposed pipeline that would take oil from North Dakota to Superior, Wisconsin, is currently routed through the lakes country of northern Minnesota. And this is kind of a follow-up question to the last question. Uh, that pipeline has generated strong opinions on both sides, those against it and those in favor of it. What's your view of the project, and would you advocate for it or against it, and do you agree with the decision recently to delay the process one year? All right. Thanks, Dennis. Mr. Purcell. Thanks, Warren. I, I, uh, I don't like to see the delay, but I believe the delay was necessary um, to ensure that we have a route that best protects the environment in Minnesota. I do not support the pipeline coming through our headwaters area. Um, we have pipelines through here and we've had some leaks, we've had some explosions, uh, nothing that uh, we haven't been able to handle, but um, I'm, I don't think we need another uh, pipeline through here. I do believe we need the pipeline. We do not want that oil coming on rail. Um, we're already seeing the problems with that and it's a highly explosive substance and uh, just the, the environmental problems associated with rail um, far outweigh in my mind the uh, environmental problems potentially associated uh, with a pipeline. So I, I, I support the pipeline. Um, I want us to continue our quest for renewables uh, in the state of Minnesota and I will uh, continue to support those policies um, and you know, if part of me says it can't come fast enough, but we've got to be deliberate and let the renewables come to us as the technology is presented to us. All right. Uh, Mr. Nelson. Well, I, for one, would appreciate the jobs coming through here. Uh, even if they are temporary, only last a couple of years, uh, it would be a nice boost to our economy. Um, I'm with John, though, about being deliberate about uh, how and where we're routing this thing. And uh, it, it's, as far as the oil companies goes, 
you know, they're probably going to wind up making uh, record profits anyway. So I say in the meantime, while well, we can, let's bend them over and squeeze them for all they're worth. Get some of that money back in Minnesota. All right. Uh, Mr. Purcell, uh, rebuttal? No, thank you. Mr. Nelson? Mm. All right. All right. Next question, uh, Zach Kaiser. Thank you, Warren. Okay. Um, do you think the current level of local government aid should increase, stay the same, or decrease? And to follow up to that, um, how would you fund an increase and how would you allocate the savings of a decrease? Okay. Uh, thank you, Zach. That question goes to Mr. Nelson. I don't actually know uh, how to, at least to have an, uh, that specific of an opinion, I don't have one. Um, I can say, though, that, that we are all Minnesota, and uh, some of our best people that are produced in the rural regions of the state go to the cities, and that's where they set up home. So I think, uh, you know, if, they, if we could find some benevolence on their part, you know, if you want that, uh, that kind of a crop of solid people coming into your workforce, you know, we need some help with stuff, like help with education and busing, because it takes forever to bus children pl places. All right. All right, thank you. Mr. Purcell? I uh, believe that the local government aid is, is integral to our state policies and, and uh, definitely support uh, the local government aid and the addition that we've been able to put toward local government aid in the, in the last few years. Um, I, I, and I, you know, I believe we need more local government aid out here. It's just we're, we're making some progress with that and, and getting better, uh, making strides towards some equity. Now, um, certainly some LGA went to the metro area, and this is a, a, a point of discussion and contention for some uh, that maybe they get more uh, local government aid than they need. And the, you get the same thing going on just about any issue that uh, just mentioned about busing kids in school districts. We get that kind of a thing too, and we've got, you know, a heck of a, a shortfall in our transportation uh, for School District 31 here, uh, right in this area. Uh, so there's always that push and pushback uh, between metro and rural, and I, I, I think we're, I, well, I know we're setting a lot better than we have been in my experience in the legislature in that we have a surplus. So we aren't behind the eight ball uh, as far as funding. We can look and take a good hard look at how can we get better LGA out to the communities that really need it and, and for what purposes it is really needed for fire and police and, uh, and also some transportation issues. Okay, thank you, Mr. Purcell. Mr. Nelson, mm. any rebuttal? No. Okay. Mr. Purcell? No. Okay. Then we'll move on to the next question, and that would be from uh, Scott Hall. All right, thanks, Warren. Um, six public elementary schools in Brainerd, uh, the Brainerd School District, were recently cited as among the best in the state and the nation for their academic achievement, also for helping the way they help disadvantaged learners achieve. So what do you think makes for successful public schools? Okay, thanks, Scott. That question goes to Mr. Purcell. Well, a number of things go into successful public school systems, into successful school systems, be they public or private, I would offer. Um, and I think one of the biggest things that we've been able to achieve in the last, in, in recent history is the all day, every day kindergarten and uh, getting the youngsters off to that positive start um, or the potentially positive start. So I believe that's a, uh, a significant issue for us. And, uh, and then, I mean, obviously we have to have good educators. Um, you know, the analogy was given to me some years ago and, uh, and I come from a, from a family of educators for, uh, I guess it's coming on 100 years now that I can recall in my family of, of educators in public school. And you know, uh, if, if all kids came to school on an equal platform, and the same as the analogy of going to the dentist, if, if the kids didn't have any cavities, then no problem, right? And everybody would be able, better educated because of that. If the kids all had that equal platform coming to school, 
And where are they coming from? What, what, what kind of background do they have? Do they have a mom and a dad? Do they have a parent at all? Those kind of things, we really need to address those better. I talked about housing issues and homelessness issues. Uh, those factor into it, substance abuse, those all factor into how well is that child going to be able to be educated? Uh, what do they have as a, as a model for them? All of those things combined with uh, good teachers and a good educational platform in a school system, um, I think are what makes for a good outcome for the students. Okay, thank you, Mr. Purcell. Mr. Nelson. What was the question again? What do you think um, makes for successful public schools? Successful public schools. Uh, <clears throat> I think I'm gonna go with Michael J. Fox on this one. Uh, he says, if uh, children can't learn the way that we teach, then we should teach the way that the children learn. Uh, I know schools in Brainerd are obviously doing something right. Uh, other places in the country, maybe not so much. Maybe other places in the state, even not so much. So I think uh, taking it from a talented and gifted man, that's some good advice. Uh, otherwise, uh, looking at the leadership of the schools too is a strong one. Um, seeing, uh, you know, the, the, what I know of, of education in our community is through the Tech College and the BSU and how they they function together, sort of. Uh, it seems to me that the, the thing that's lacked the most in that specific instance has been a strong leadership that has a vested interest in the community. Uh, it's everybody who's come through the tech college has been pretty much just looking to pad their resume or waiting out for retirement. Uh, if we could find somebody who actually cares about Bemidji and its success and the role of the university and the tech college within this community, I think we would find ourselves on a better step there. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Nelson. M uh, Mr. Purcell, any rebuttal? You know, I, I would, just, would just offer that uh, um, uh, the Cass Lake School District recently uh, overcame some significant barriers and went from, from the bottom of the heap, if you will, to near the top of the heap in the credit was given to the students by the faculty, that it was the students that made that difference. And, and having a positive role model, obviously the, the, the teachers, the school board, the community got together on this, right? And school district 115 turned it around. They were, a fa they were labeled a failing school uh, four years ago or three and a half years ago. They turned it around, so it, it's, I, I would offer attitude has a significant part to play. Okay, Mr. Nelson, any rebuttal? No, I think it's pretty good. All right, uh, we'll move on to the next question, uh, and that would be Dennis Wyman. Okay, well, let's stay with education, move on to higher education. What's your philosophy when it comes to funding higher education in Minnesota? Should it be funded at a high enough level that a college education is easily within reach for most people? and they don't have to be so reliant on student loans and grants, or is that not practical or even the government's role? Okay, thank you, Dennis. That question goes to Mr. Nelson. Hi, uh, oof. Um, yeah, I see a lot of my friends, uh, you know, being 33 here, right at the, at the very beginning of the millennial generation, and I see people I graduated high school with and then younger, um, walking out of college with this huge amount of debt and basically the best that they can do for job is flip burgers somewhere, uh, which is not conducive to utilizing a brain full of really good information. Um, I think something different needs to be done. I hear a lot of people talk about how it was back in the 60s and 70s, getting to go to college and, uh, or even at a, a student could work full time over the summer, save enough money to pay for their tuition and half of their room and board for the whole year. A summer job. When is the last time a summer job could afford that? And I think that comes back to the job creation and spend money in your country. All right, thanks Mr. Nelson. Mr. Purcell? I'd, I'll go to, again, to my opening statement or, or, or nearly there in uh, that the 
higher education formula for student success uh, cannot be having a burden of debt when you're done. It, it, it doesn't work, and it doesn't work for the success of that student. Or they're going to be engaged with a job if they're fortunate to get one. They're going to have maybe want to look at a home, going to have some kind of wheels, and have something that they're going to have to transport themselves uh, and pay for transportation. So I, I, as I said earlier, if we can get back to where the, the formula used to be about 70% state tuition funded and 30% student and get back to something close to that anyway, and we're working our way toward that. Uh, in, in this last uh, couple of years, we've put some funding into higher ed. We've got a tuition freeze uh, uh, proposal on the, on the table now to freeze tuition through 2017. I want to see that enacted. Let's, uh, let's give this a chance. All right. uh, thank you, Mr. Purcell. Uh, Mr. Nelson, any rebuttal? Mr. Purcell, any rebuttal? No, thank you. All right. Let's move on to the next question. Uh, Zach Kaiser. Thank you, Warren. Uh, this was touched on briefly before, but I think it's worth um, revisiting. Um, what can the legislature do to support homeless people in Bemidji and throughout Minnesota? All right, uh, thanks, Zach. That first question, that question will go to Mr. Purcell. Um, thank you, and I, I, I did earlier talk about uh, unprecedented $100 million that we put into bonding uh, to address housing issues, and some of that certainly is going to address homelessness issues. Um, you know, and, and the state is partnering up with, with uh, um, various uh, local governments and, uh, and nonprofits, uh, and that was how we were able to achieve that $100 million unprecedented bonding for housing was by all of the entities coming together and saying, okay, let's do this and let's see how much success we can build upon. So the, um, the and it's just a start. We're, we're only going to start with that $100 million. The, the, but the issue of homelessness, uh, it, we have to think about it in, uh, in the encompassing way. That, we, that, that is going to bring us success in dealing with it, and that is um, people are homeless because they don't have a job, they have substance abuse issues. Um, what is all involved with uh, the reason that person is homeless? Uh, about 30% of the homeless out there uh, in this state and nationwide are veterans. I uh, know a little bit about that, um, uh, being a veteran. I know some vets that are homeless. They've got a set of issues, not just Veterans have those issues, but they have a set of issues. We've identified them, and we can do something you know, in, in being helpful for veterans and the rest of our community that has these homeless issues. But it's going to take a dedicated, long-term uh, commitment to funding. All right. Thank you, Mr. Purcell. Mr. Nelson. I think uh, in addition to uh, looking at uh, government funds to help these projects uh, get up and going, it's also, uh, it also comes down to the local community level. In Bemidji here we have the Nameless Coalition for the Homeless uh, who have been working on this problem for a couple of years now, looking at it and trying to come up with solutions. Uh, as some of you know or don't, uh, we've had several homeless people over the last half a dozen years uh, decease on us in ways that are, were probably avoidable. Um, and it really wasn't necessary. Uh, it's easy to see through these people when you see them walking around uh, or sitting on the benches downtown, but they're people just like you and me. They have life experiences just like you and me. Um, and uh, they've learned some things along the way, and if we actually take a moment to see them as human beings, then you know, maybe we actually have a heart, find a heart to, to help them out and say, here's a shelter over your head. You know, it's not rocket science. Okay, thank you, Mr. Nelson. Uh, Mr. Purcell, uh, rebuttal? I, I agree, it's not rocket science. Okay, Mr. Nelson, mm. rebuttal? All right. Uh, next question um, from Scott Hall. Okay, Warren, thanks. What's your understanding of treaties with Indian nations and how they now apply to relations between the state of Minnesota and Indian nations here? Okay. Thanks, Scott. Uh, that question goes to Mr. Nelson.
treaty is a society's word. Uh, when you sign the treaty, the leaders sign the treaty, they are giving their word as a representative of the people underneath them, um, by proxy, the word of everyone who is there at the time. Uh, if you have a shred of honor, stand up to your word. All right, thanks, Mr. Nelson. Mr. Purcell? Uh, you know, I, I said at the outset they've worked on the Leech Lake Reservation for a number of decades, and, and um, I'm, I'm fairly familiar with a number of treaties, not all, but uh, with a number of treaties between the United States government and, and uh, tribes in Minnesota. And um, certainly, I mean, they're uh, deemed to be legally the law of the land and need to be upheld and honored. Um, and a couple of things come along with the treaties and are often mentioned in treaties. And that is, uh, one of them is uh, 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 endeavoring to live together uh, between the, the, uh, uh, those who signed the treaties and who they represented. Uh, and uh, there's another thing that, that, that comes along with it, and it's something that, that I think is an outcome of the treaty and the and, and treaties, and that is that uh, the Native American community, Native Americans have served in our military in a greater percentage than any other ethnicity in the United States of America. And I'm talking men and women. You might be surprised at how many women veterans there are in, in Native America. Um, so I, I, it's, it's, it's an honorable uh, duty that we carry forward. And uh, you know, it, it, it comes down to you get attorneys in the middle of a lot of things. and. You know, God bless attorneys. We couldn't live with them, can't live without them, I guess. But, uh, um, but that's where some of the, some of the real, uh, uh, the rubber hits the road, if you will, and, and it gets uh, a little more difficult sometimes. But we need to, we need to uphold our, our duties. All right. Thank you, Mr. Purcell. Uh, Mr. Nelson, any rebuttal? Mm -mm. Okay. Mr. Purcell? No. Okay. Uh, next question, Dennis Wyman. Thanks, Warren, and we're going to ask a question now that was sent to us by a, a viewer. Uh, regardless of your opinion about Minsure, let's assume for the sake of this question that it's here to stay, at least for the foreseeable future. What changes, if any, would you like to make to Minsure in order to make it as effective and efficient as possible? All right. Thanks, Dennis. Uh, that question goes to Mr. Nelson. Mm, how to make it insurance efficient. Uh, how to make insurance efficient. Stop paying them so much. Require them to pay out more percentage-wise. Uh, as I understand, there's certain insurance companies that are only required to pay out like 10% of what they take in in claims. Uh, isn't the purpose of an insurance company or insurance policy to be insured in case something really bad happens? And they're s sucking 90% of this money to themselves, which I understand administrative, whatever, and that's fine. 90%? Um, I'm of the opinion, <coughs> excuse me, I'm of the opinion that health insurance is not a right. Uh, a right is something that you have because you exist, because you're alive, nobody can give it to you, nobody can take it away from you. Health insurance and education are not rights. It doesn't matter if we even put them into the Constitution, it is not a right because it has outside, requires something from the outside coming in in order for you to have it. That being said, I think both of these things are extremely good ideas and uh, as being in a, uh, call ourselves a modern society, providing these two things for every individual within our, within our system, I think is a good idea. I mean, to have a, a workforce of overeducated people, that it sounds horrible, you know, really horrible. Overeducate everybody, it's a bad idea. All right, thanks Mr. Nelson. Mr. Purcell? Thank you, Warren, I, um, I, I just need to, to say before I address the Minsure, just a couple of seconds that that in Minnesota we do have education in our constitution that we will educate every kid and and so I and I believe that uh, I believe we need to do that. Um, uh, the Minsure, uh, you know, this is we knew this wasn't going to be the perfect uh, the perfect set of circumstances. 
uh, for um, implementing health care in Minnesota. And part of the reason we knew that is because Minnesota had a pretty good health care system before the Affordable Care Act came along at the federal level and before MNSURE was developed. We were doing pretty well. Um, on the positive side of the ledger, we have reduced the uninsured population in Minnesota by about 40 percent, 40 some percent. So we've been successful. We've got more folks that have insurance. Uh, the health care costs uh, likely will never go down, but we seem to be stemming the tide of the, the percentage that they're going to, to, to rise or it's going to cost us more. Um, so I, I, I think we, we look for ways to gain those efficiencies uh, in, within the system that we have now. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm very willing to learn how we can gain those efficiencies in our MNSURE system. A lot of it right now appears to me that, to be that computers basically aren't talking to each other. That's, that's my take on we've got a lot of insurance companies that don't seem to be able to communicate with the, with the computers at the state of Minnesota and the program that, it, you know, like you have Word 2007 and I got 2013. I mean, that, that's a little bit of, a, of, a, of an overstatement, but uh, okay. that's what it appears to me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Purcell. And um, Mr. Nelson, any rebuttal? Um, no, I'm okay. Okay. Mr. Purcell, any rebuttal? No, thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, next question, uh, Zach Kaiser. Thank you, Warren. Um, what would you do to secure state funding for a veteran's home in Bemidji? All right, and that question goes to Mr. Purcell. Thank you. Um, well, <clears throat> our biggest roadblock to secure funding for our veteran's home in Northwest Minnesota or Northern Minnesota is the United States government and the Congress. <laughs> That is the biggest roadblock for us uh, at this time. Now, we did overcome a, a small part of that roadblock recently in that the Minneapolis Veterans Home was fully funded to be completed. And that has always been held out as got to get the Minneapolis home done before we're going to do any, any other homes or even consider any other homes in Minnesota. And so now our next step is how many more beds are we going to be able to to convince the federal government that we need in Minnesota. What's the need? And we have the, uh, the legislature put uh, $250,000 into uh, a small uh, grant that uh, is going through the housing department to look at for communities to identify what they believe are their needs. And we are going to identify what the needs are. We have identified what the needs are up here. and We're going to move forward with that. Um, and push as hard as we can. All right. Thank you, Mr. Purcell. Mr. Nelson. Our military personnel have uh, volunteered. Uh, of themselves, the most called the vital part of their life. And through that time, that, that, that 18 to 20 something, is one of the times of life where you are set into and ingrained into a specific way of being. The way that you are is the way that pretty much going to be this way for the rest of your life. We put our children, our young adults, into situations that are so brutally traumatic that they can no longer function sometimes within society as a quote unquote productive member. I think this comes back to keeping your word. They fight for you, fight for them too, because you know everybody's everybody needs a place to stay. And if it's in the if it's in the dawning years of life or the excuse me the waning years of life, help them out. You know, you wouldn't want to have to worry about it. And if you can't function normally anyways, well, geez, give them that break. All right. Thanks, Mr. Nelson. Uh, Mr. Purcell, a rebuttal? No, thank you. Okay, Mr. Nelson. All right. Our next question would be from Scott Hall. 
North Dakota oil producers have been able to get rail service ahead of Minnesota's agricultural producers and iron ore producers who need to get their, mar their products to market in a more timely way. Um, Governor Dayton has tried to be a little out front in addressing this need, but what do you think can be done to, uh, prior for the, to allow these products to get to market that are made in Minnesota rather than the oil have taking a higher priority? All right, thanks, Scott. Uh, that question goes to Mr. Nelson. Hmm. Not sure I really understand the question, so I'm just going to go with what I get. Um, uh, talking about products leaving Minnesota, um, my dad's got a great idea, and I think it comes along with, uh, well, oil, you can't really do much to oil. Here's oil. Go heat it up and whatever. Get stuff out of it. Uh, we got this copper. We got the iron. Uh, my dad had a good idea. So why don't, uh, when we ship out these materials from Minnesota or from the country in general, uh, if China needs I-beams, let's send them I-beams and not a ship full of scrap metal for them to make their own I-beams out of. I think if we apply the same basic thing to uh, the natural resources that are br uh, brought out of Minnesota, not only in mining but also the agriculture of, of sending into the country and into the global marketplace finished products and not raw materials, uh, I, think, uh, I think we'll find ourselves in a different situation than we're at now, certainly more jobs. and. Uh, Potentially, no, well, happier life. Wouldn't that be nice? Okay, thanks, Mr. Nelson. Mr. Purcell? Um, for sure. And, uh, Philip, I like your dad's idea and, uh, and uh, have been uh, um, talking about that for some time myself. Let's do for more, more for ourselves. Uh, let's make more of our own products that we can uh, buy and sell domestically and overseas. Um, I, I think that, um, that we talked about the petroleum products issues earlier, and, and uh, I, I do not know how the petroleum industry is able to get uh, first choice at, at rail. I mean, I, I, I suppose they're paying for it, and, uh, um, and to the detriment of, of uh, our coal and agriculture and, and now we're getting ready for winter here. Um, so I mean it, it speaks a little bit to the fact that uh, that we need to have an alternative for the petroleum products to move, going back to the pipeline thing, um, because uh, we've downsized our rail enough over the last 50, 60 years that we don't have the capacity that we used to have. Um, and, uh, and, and I think we we do want to use our rail to the best of our ability. It is efficient. Um, so I, I, I don't have, I, I can't give you a good answer about what do I think, why do, uh, I, I, I think that uh, a product that uh, is going to pay more for the service is getting precedence. I think it just about boils down to that. All right. Uh, thanks, Mr. Purcell. Uh, Mr. Nelson, any rebuttal? Uh, I think just on the railway, uh, you know, it's, I'm a huge fan of the railway because that's what built this country and it's uh, like Mr. Purcell said, it's the most efficient route for us to ship stuff because for a long time uh, we didn't need to uh, take things the long slow way on the railway. We could just throw it on a truck and get it to where we needed to go in a couple of days at most. Um, we're not really there anymore. You know, we aren't affluent like we used to be. All right. Uh, Mr. Purcell, any? No, thank you. All right, uh, then I think that we can move on to closing comments. Um, and uh, up first for closing comments is uh, Mr. Purcell. Well, thank you again, uh, Warren and the panel of uh, uh, questions, questioners. Um, I uh, have always appreciated um, being able to participate in the uh, Lakeland Public TV candidate forums and um, uh, the opportunity that uh, that Public TV provides to viewers in northern Minnesota uh, and Minnesota in in general because uh, I know some of these uh, shows you can see down in the metropolitan area because I see them when I'm in session and I get a chance to get back to where I live when I'm down there. 
Um, and so I, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to, uh, to discuss issues. I, I, I just want to say we've, we've climbed out of a hole here uh, in my six years in the legislature now, the first four, we were busy fighting over, it seemed, uh, you know, who could, who could uh, uh, shift things around the most and, and how do we, how do we, and we couldn't find the funds to do what we needed to do and we finally did that and, and it was, uh, uh, you know, going to be the downfall of the state of Minnesota because we raised taxes and I believe that's what we had to do and now we have funding that we can put toward and did put toward uh, homelessness issues, higher ed issues, K-12 issues. Uh, we have one left to go here and that's transportation. And we haven't solved that one yet, but we have to figure that out. And I wanna go back to St. Paul and help be part of that solution. All right, thank you, Mr. Purcell. Mr. Nelson. I'd like to say thanks everybody. Uh, this has certainly been an experience. Uh, Mr. Purcell, I want to thank you for your six years of leadership. Um, certainly is a, a lot of Republicans have plenty of things to say about you when you're not around, but I'm going to say it, I'm not going to begrudge a man for doing what he knows to do, so thank you, sir. Uh, to Minnesota, um, hi guys, I'm Philip, and honey, I'll be home. I'll put the kids to bed tonight. So, good night. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much. And I, I would like to take this time to uh, thank the candidates for participating. Uh, it's important that we have opportunities to hear uh, what, what our candidates are thinking and, give, and develop clear choices. Uh, if you've missed any portion of tonight's debate and would like to watch it again, it will be available on the Lakeland Public Television website within 24 hours. That website is uh, lptv.org. Also, to read a recap of tonight's debate, you can pick up a copy of tomorrow's Bemidji Pioneer or log on to the Bemidji Pioneer website at BemidjiPioneer.com. Um, our next debate will begin in a few minutes. It's at 8 p.m., House 5B with uh, Tom Anzell and Justin Eichhorn. Uh, good night and thanks for watching.